Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out for the first talk of the last day of the conference after the dinner. Uh, my name is Doug, and I'm going to talk to you about a website I help run, which is called Open Access Archaeology. So our project began a couple of years ago, all the way back in 2011. Um, back then, we were seeing a sort of general problem, and that was in archaeology, no one really knew what open access, access was. You'd say open access, and you'd get sort of a blank look. Uh, if you were lucky, someone would say they'd open source their paper, which I actually am quite forgiving of, but open sourcing is code, open access is publishing, so you saw a lot of people with confusion. Uh, There's a lot of opinions that we didn't need open access, that somehow every single person who ever needed to access any archaeology article ever had that access, and no one else needed to see it. Um, and there was also some general misconceptions about open access, the, you know, it's anti-academic, it's taking away your choice, all these different sort of misconceptions happening, and this was only a couple of years ago. So we decided to do something about it. Uh, we basically created a website. <coughs> uh, we're not very creative with names, so we just called it Open Access Archaeology. And the idea was sort of get information out there, teach archaeologists about open access, and we thought the best way to do that would be to give resources. So our website has a searchable index of different journals that publish archaeology, um, that either partial open access or fully open access. Uh, let people know about the, the uh, options they have. We also did a bunch of different things. Uh, so these are open access cupcakes. Um, there's a QR code on there. And we did this at the CAA UK chapter a couple of years ago. Um, I'd like to take credit for this, but it was the brilliant idea of LP archaeology. And so we gave out cupcakes, and people scanned the code, and it took them to an open access resource or a journal or an article or something along those lines, a database. And lots of people, they're very popular because you're giving away free food. Um, always very popular. We also did a scrapping of a bunch of articles. Um, after about a day, we stopped when we had about 11,000 open access archaeology articles. Um, that was more than enough. So we put that in a database, and we automated a lot of social media. So we sent out a tweet every couple of hours uh, with a link to an article that is open access. Uh, we do the same on Tumblr. We're doing it a bit right now, so there's not as much publishing going on in the Tumblr and so forth. But it's been very successful. Uh, we have 6,500 uh, Twitter followers, about 3,500 Tumblr followers. And these are people who are literally just following us to get links to open access articles in archaeology. It holds a diverse range. Uh, so there is definitely a lot of interest and need. Um, if, if you told me a couple of years ago you know, your Twitter account would have more than 200 people following it, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, because I didn't think it was going to be that big, but it has been quite big, and lots of people actually really enjoy um, open access and um, access to the different resources. It's not just archaeologists, it's people interested in archaeology are following us as well. So uh, just to give you some background general overall, there's a ROAR map, which is basically tracks uh, sort of mandates for open access, and that has exploded. Um, when they first started tracking back in 2003, they had one, I think that was just because that was the first one they put in the database, it was, but it was still very small, only a couple of dozen mandates. Now there's over 600 mandates around the world, um, and these are huge. The U.S. government now mandates open access archaeology, uh, European Research uh, Foundation, the Gates Foundation, all mandating open access. And it's getting bigger, uh, SAA just announced that they're going to be going open access. Um, potentially the largest professional or organization full of professional archaeologists in the world has just decided that their journal is going to go open access. So in a few short years, we've gone from people not knowing what open access is to everyone almost knowing what open access is or having a general idea because they have to. Because now if you get money from almost anyone, you're going to probably have to end up publishing open access. And these mandates keep going and they keep expanding. Um, I would not be surprised if it starts to hit the commercial world of archaeology soon. <coughs> and we've seen the, the growth go up as well. I presented this 
at the Southampton CAA graph, and it's changed dramatically. Open access has expanded quite a bit. Um, commercial publishing has also gone up. Sort of nonprofit publishing has actually gone down as more of them are now being taken over by commercial entities. Um, and open access, more and more people are going open access. So uh, we're starting to see archaeology, the world of publishing, starting to split into two, two directions. And one is the open access direction, and one is a more commercial publishing, and many sort of small independent uh, publishers and societies are actually either going with a commercial entity to handle all their publishing or going open access. Uh, so soon we might only have about two major choices for publishing in archaeology. Victory, right? Uh, everyone knows we're going open access. Isn't that great? Uh, our job should be done. It's not. I think just the fact that we're moving towards open access is one of potentially many fights that we will be having over the future. So um, if you've ever taken a negotiation class, I'll tell you this great story. Unfortunately, this family lost their son. The company was at fault. They went to negotiate you know, how much the company was going to pay. And the family went and said, we're given the option to put down a price. And they said, no, the company should go first. And so the company came back and said $8,000 for one human life. They undercut it so much. But what they did was a, a negotiation tactic. And that's called an anchor. So when you see people go and they say they're suing whoever for $10 million, they're not expecting to get $10 million. They're wanting to raise the price up so when you negotiate, you go towards the middle. And we're seeing that happening in publishing right now. It does not cost $3,000 to do an open access charge for an article. That's ridiculous. Everyone knows that. But lots of publishers are putting out their anchors right now. They're trying to keep the profits up. Um, and it's, it's great when you see them do the math. They basically say, well, we make this amount of money now, we publish this many articles, and we have 40% profit margins. Let's just divide how much money we make now by how many articles, and that's our price. And that's what they're trying to do. And that's going to be a huge battle, because most archaeologists cannot afford $3,000. Um, many small grants don't even give out $3,000. So <coughs> that's going to be a huge battle coming up in, in uh, open access, is lots of publishers such as Elsevier, Wiley, and so forth, are going to be raising their prices ridiculously high, higher than most archaeologists can afford. Um, and that is just so that when people start negotiating, they get closer to their, their price. One thing that I feel gets left out a lot about the conversation of open access is everyone's like, oh, you have two choices. You have green open access, and you have gold open access. Green is you deposit it into some sort of repository. Gold is you pay sort of some sort of authoring processing charge. And almost everyone tends to forget about platinum. Platinum open access is you don't have to pay. Someone else picks up the bill. And it can be done quite cheaply. The directory of open access journals, more than 60% are platinum, as in no one pays. People pick up the tab somewhere else. And there's various ways of doing that. Sometimes libraries do it. Sometimes organizations pick it up. Sometimes it's all volunteer. Um, lots of journals run on just being volunteer. And they're excellent journals. Um, and I feel like this is another argument that we're having, is all the publishers have now gone, oh, open access, you mean gold open access. And when we're having this conversation about open access, we're having this conversation like, oh, you should pay a fee. Our authors should pay the fee. Um, and that's, not, that's only one potential route. There's also the green route. And there is the platinum route. And um, I might be a little biased, but I kind of like the platinum route. It uh, has the best options, and I can publish. So my talk, or the rest of it, is going to focus on just one of these sort of battlegrounds. <coughs> and that is the societies. Most societies now publish some sort of journal. And that is a lot of what societies do. Um, and there's a lot of them. Uh, so this is just from the UK. They estimate there's about 2,000 societies, you know, approximately a quarter of a million people in the UK who are a member of an archaeology society. Many of these people are amateur. Professional is only around 6,000 um, at this current moment. But there's a lot of people, and they publish a lot, and lots of journals are done, at least in archaeology, by societies. Um, almost every state in the United States has a local archaeology society that has some sort of journal. And of course, the big ones, 
World Archaeology Congress, uh, SAA, SHA, AIA, EAA, something that ends in A because we like archaeology. Um, and there's this huge debate going on. And these societies are now seeing all these mandates. And the big problem with societies is there's this perception that people are only a member of these societies because of the publication. So if you suddenly start giving away the publication, either through gold open access, green open access, or platinum open access, why are people going to be members of these societies? <coughs> I think this uh, opens up some very interesting questions. Do we even need societies? As a, a good, good question. Um, and do we actually know that people only join societies for publication? So CAA has just become a society of some sort, an organization. Um, and we are a conference organization. So basically, the number of people who are members of CAA are the number of people who go to the conference, plus like 10. And that's it. Um, EAA works very much a similar way. So it's not all about the publishing. Um, EAA, WAC, um, all their memberships are basically by the number of people who go to their conference, give or take a couple. Um, but I think these debates are important to have, but they kind of sidetrack the whole issue. And we're sort of simple, uh, making it much more, more complicated. And really the issue is you should be able to publish if you want to. So a society should exist, and they should have the ability to publish if they want to, or if they just want to have a conference, they should be able to do that. It should be choice. We shouldn't be arguing about, well, what our society is only about publishing. Um, but if they do want to publish, it's a bit more difficult than uh, simply putting a PDF on a website. Open access is incredibly easy to do. It's a PDF on a website with a license saying anyone can reuse it. Open access done well is a bit hard. It's complicated. You have to have DOIs so people can find your articles in case your website breaks down or you know, your journal shuts down. Um, you need locks. So what happens if your society stops publishing? Where do all that digital uh, papers go? Who preserves it? Um, these are all issues that I think are very complicated. And I don't want to just downplay what publishers do. They do an incredible amount of technical work, uh, crossref, locks, all these sort of different things that are a bit difficult to replicate. Not impossible. And there's actually quite a bit of uh, economic scales. And right now, if you were to do that sort of publishing, you have sort of three options. You have very large commercial publishers um, who are only going to get larger. So uh, Springer and Nature just merged. Um, and most likely, if you talk to anyone in publishing, the next couple of years is going to see massive mergers. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we have Springer versus Veer or uh, Manny Wiley Blackwell or something like that in the near future. Um, publishing has consolidated in the early 1990s. There's maybe 400 publishers. That's down to only a couple of major ones. Many university presses have closed down. Um, lots of mergers, lots of buyouts. <coughs> Manny has done an amazing job of, of uh, going after the archaeology sector. So they've taken over the journals from uh, Left Coast Press. Um, they have went from, in a couple of years, a dozen journals to almost 40 now in archaeology and heritage. Um, and you're going to see that. And there's economics of scale. Um, and there's reasons for that, and I'm not really going to go into that um, too much, but basically we're running into fewer and fewer choices when we publish in large, with large publishers. They're all consolidating, and soon you're going to only have a couple of large ones at all. And then you have your sort of more boutique uh, publishers, so Ubiquity Press, Archeo Press, University Presses. Um, they're very nice, they're very good, but they tend to be a bit small. And if you're doing journal publishing, um, scale matters. And then you have sort of the last thing, which is do-it-yourself or do-it-yourself manage, which is basically open journal systems. It is what everyone uses to do their publishing. And that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk, uh, trying to solve some problems there. It's a great system. <coughs> open journal systems has done amazing things for publishing. Um, it's a bit dated. Uh, if you've ever used it, the user interface is sort of stuck circa 2001, 2002. Um, there's supposed to be a new version that's com supposed to have come out a year ago to fix that. Maybe it's coming out. Um, it has a very small user base, basically people who are just publishing. 
Um, and it doesn't, it's its own content management system. It doesn't really play well with other websites and other content management systems. So if you set up a journal system, you have to basically set up two websites. And if you're a small society who runs on volunteers, that's two websites you have to manage. That's two different systems you have to update. That's two different systems. that security patches. That's a lot of work. And when you're talking about societies, it's mainly volunteers. In fact, it's almost always volunteers. And that's someone's time. And that is assuming someone in that society can manage how to do this. Um, open Journal Systems is fairly good, but you still have to know how to work a server. And in many cases, many organizations don't actually have someone to do that. I know in this conference that probably half the people in this room could set up a website and server easily in five minutes. Um, and this might not be the conference to be saying this, but you go to many other organizations and no one has the ability to uh, add a, a content management system. They have to basically have it done for them. And it's real interesting when you sort of look back at the history of content management systems. They were all formed around the late 1990s, early 2000s. And that was basically when people realized you needed to have economics of scale with web publishing and no one wanted to spend a million dollars to do every website, uh, which some websites were costing that much in 1997. Um, and lots of systems have come out and we're actually starting to sort of see winners and losers of these systems. So WordPress now owns about 60% of the content management system around the world. Now that translates to only about 25% of websites because some websites still have their own custom systems or they hide what sort of system they have for security reasons, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, WordPress has, has the most. The next is Joomla, followed by Drupal. Um, OJS, it doesn't even register. There's not enough journals out there to even crack uh, a rounding error on these numbers. Um, and the advantage of a lot of these systems are, so WordPress has lots of users, lots of developers, uh, more plugins, modules, themes. Many of them are low quality, many of them are high quality, but you have so much choice. Um, and you have really good security. And something like open journal systems, it's great. Lot, some people support it, but it's a small, small user base. And so if you've ever used it, they have a very limited amount of plugins, a very limited amount of features. <coughs> and I think that's kind of holding back a lot of societies. So if I were to go to a society and say, here's a plugin, just add it, click a button, and you have a journal system, they would do it. It'd be easy, it'd be one system, you could do it, um, and we're thinking about possibly doing this with WordPress. So with WordPress, you don't duplicate, you don't run into that problem with, so open journal systems, you have one login for that, you have one login for your society website. If you were to make a plugin for WordPress, you have one login, one email system, basically it's one system, and it's building off a framework. And WordPress is almost there. Um, there actually is a journal publishing theme, um, Adam. Uh, there's something like DOJ, DOHA, which is the Directory of Open Access Journals. You can export that, your, all your metadata to that. Uh, they have social login, they have Crossref, uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, there are a few, few things that they're missing, such as locks and DOI integration, though a plugin just came out two months ago. Um, I'm still playing around with it to see how it works, but for the most part, you could create a journal system with WordPress. And so right now I'm in the process of sort of fixing those last couple of technical issues before WordPress could become a journal system. Before we could basically go and say to societies, you want to publish open access? Click this button. That's all you have to do. Click one button, import, it does it all for you. Um, and so that is the idea, that's the goal, is to reach these societies who for technical reasons can't basically put up their own open journal system. They don't have technical know-how. It seems very complex. Um, and they need someone to help them out. And so that's the idea, is to sort of target these sort of different societies, help them get to that idea of open access, uh, whether it be gold or green or hopefully platinum uh, open access. And so that's the system we're talking about right now. And in the port, uh, part of developing it. And ideally, the code base is going to be PHP. So it could be probably ported to, say, Drupal or Joomla or whatever the society's website is running on. Well, not whatever, because 
there's a lot of other stuff out there, but if it's PHP, if it's one of the major co uh, content management systems, you can just simply open up a journal, it'll do everything for you, it'll do locks, um, and I think that is incredibly important because I've seen uh, with our journal system we track, we've been tracking, and some journals have disappeared. Some open access journals no longer exist, and those articles, we can't find them. Maybe someone has them on a PDF on their, uh, on their desktop, but, and this has only been since 2011 when we had our, our, our list of journals that do open access. Some have disappeared, and they're not in um, Internet Archive or anything like that. So those articles, I don't know, maybe someone deposited them somewhere, but I'm guessing a good portion of them have disappeared. And I think that's a critical issue. You need to take something so complex as like preservation and for all these societies that do have journals. And to be honest, this happens with paper as well. Um, libraries go through every year and pulp a good portion of their collections. Um, they don't really talk about it. No one really talks about it. But a library is not going to preserve a hard copy for forever. And if no one's reading it, um, it'll go to storage. And if after a while, if it's not being used in storage, it'll get pulped. Or accidents happen. Um, a university I was at destroyed uh, 20, 20 shells worth of BBC archives. Um, and they now have to get a copy from the only remaining archive. But basically, it went down to one BBC archive because someone decided they needed the room, didn't really ask around, and sent it off to the shredder. Actually, they just tossed it out the back. Um, and that happens all the time. And I think we need to have a system where you could go to a website, you put in this plugin. It manages all the preservation, it sends out the metadata, it sends it off to something like locks or clocks or preservation area, and they don't need to worry about it. And then we know it's preserved for forever. So that's the idea, is to try to create a plugin. And that's sort of our next thing with open access archaeology, is we've sort of changed from trying to get people to know about uh, open access to making open access easier for everyone to do. And not to end on a downer, but this is only part of the equation. We're only helping people with the tools. There are still many other major problems that need to be taken care of. Um, I do love Ubiquity Press. They're very open and honest about what they do and their costs and everything like that. And this is a breakdown of how much uh, an article costs with them. <coughs> and, oh, they only charge 250 pounds or 300 pounds for their articles. Um, but as you can see, there are costs that are associated with this. And so DOIs, money has to come from somewhere. Um, if you were to do platinum, you could probably get rid of the waiver. Um, and some of these costs can be taken away, but we do need to figure out a way of managing these costs. There cannot be a zero cost open access. I think there are ways around that. I think if we were to get together with some of the larger bodies, societies, you could easily get economics of scale if everyone was sharing the same system. Uh, but we still do need to have costs. So we're only at the moment targeting one very small area, and that's the ability to set up an open access website uh, easily that integrates with uh, websites. And this is aimed at societies who will already have a website, but they have very little skills. Um, and there's still many other problems to, to work on. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you check out our website. We have an excellent journal search if you're looking for a place to publish open access. Thank you.